And good morning and welcome to Christ Church. Come on, would you join me in standing? Shut our hands. Commit this next ministry to you to the Lord. And be reminded of what we know is true. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion by his blood. I Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name I believe. Ashamed of the gospel. I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sing it out. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No. Isaiah 40, the prophet writes, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I will spring forth. 
and bring to the deserts, rivers, the sickness and believe that God wants to continue to do more this next ministry year. The darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up. church family, I pray that our commitment to you would be obedience, would be discipleship, would be an unwavering commitment to the mission in which you've called us to. I pray our commitment to you this next ministry year would be an expectation of what we've just sung, that revival will take place in our gatherings. Young men and women, old men and women, come to know the saving reality of Jesus Christ as a Savior and King. We pray that you would move in power in our midst, that you would show us again your kindness and your glory, reveal from your word weekend after weekend your truth, and bind our hearts to you, Lord Jesus, we pray until your return. That is our commitment and our prayer. Would you do that, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Maybe so. Let's be seated together.
Oh, well, what a blessing it is to be able to come together as a church family and to be able to worship. Uh, man, what a joy. I, I feel so much gratitude to be here with all of you this morning. My name is Jeff Mile. I have the privilege of leading our church planting efforts through our church planting arm of Christ Church called Vintage Mission. And it's a blessing to be able to welcome you to our worship services this morning. Church family, as always, want to encourage you to take out your mobile device, uh, scroll up to that app, and get on there and do those couple of things that we ask you to do every single week. Uh, the first one is fill out the communication card. We want to know that you are here. And then in addition to that, make sure that you share your prayer requests with us. We want to be able to pray with you and come before the throne of grace on your behalf throughout this week. And that's a blessing for us to be able to do. So please, please share those prayer requests with us. Guests, thank you so much for joining with us uh, this weekend at our worship services. It is not lost on us in any way what it feels like to walk into a room where you don't know what's about to happen and you don't know anyone. So thank you for taking the risk and for being with us this morning. Uh, hopefully you had the opportunity to meet with our team on the way in at the first time guest tent. And if you did, they handed you a gift. And as a part of that gift, there's a communication card, a connection card. And we'd love to ask you to fill that out. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can scan that QR code on the card and all that digital information will go directly to our team. Or you can do it the old fashioned way, pen and uh, paper and drop that in one of our offering boxes on your way out the door this morning. Now, if you're like me, I would have I would have been like, I ain't going to no first time guest tent. I'm not doing that. And um, if that's you, we still want that opportunity to connect with you this morning. And there's a simple and easy way to do that. On your way out the door, in the middle of our lobby, there's a carpeted area called the hub. And we'll have some team members there. They'll have lanyards on. They'd love to answer any questions about Christ Church and help you to get connected uh, here with us. Now, this is a big weekend for us, and I'm excited uh, to share a couple of things with you. Uh, the first thing that's really cool about this weekend is we have the opportunity, something near and dear to my heart, to welcome three brand new church planters and their families into our Vintage Mission Training Center for our fall season of training. I'm going to introduce you to them. You see their pictures on the slide on the screen. Uh, they're right here in the front row, minus one. Uh, Brandon Delage, you already know this guy. He and Maddie are going to be planting in the city of Tempe, and next to him is Brian Holt, his wife Anna could not be here with us, and they're going to be planning in the south side of Indianapolis in an area called Greenwood. Uh, over in our venue right now is another guy, Hudson, and his wife, Brooklyn, and they're going to be planting in North Phoenix. And what you may not know is in the last four years, Christ Church through Vintage Mission has planted 13 churches. We have two more churches that launch this coming fall. Yes. So two more churches, one launches next month in Anthem, Cal uh, sorry, in Napa, California, and then the next one will launch in December in Anthem. And we're thrilled that these men and their families are now a part of this uh, with us. So we would ask you, please pray for them, encourage them as you see them around here for the next five months, interact with them and support them in every way you can, because they're going to plant brand new gospel outposts where people's lives are going to be changed for all of eternity. So be in prayer and be in support of them. Here's the second thing about this weekend. Uh, it's the brand new start of our ministry season for the year. And our theme this year is united. And we are excited and expectant for all that God is going to do in our midst. Here at Christ Church, we are committed to living in a way that clearly demonstrates the goodness, grace, and glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Our mission is to make disciples by loving God and by loving one another. This mission is the foundation for every ministry at Christ Church, and we are unashamed of our commitment to be united in Jesus Christ, united in discipleship, united in love, united in prayer, and united in our collective mission to honor the Lord our God. Although we are an ordinary people, we worship an extraordinary God, and our church represents the unification of believers and followers of Jesus Christ. As we unite as one church across multiple locations and through all ministries, we are eternally blessed by what the Lord has done here at Christ Church and in the hearts and minds of our various congregations, team members, and ministry staff. God is at work here at Christ Church, and he continues to do his life-changing and heart-transforming work among us. We are eternally thankful for all he has done, for his continued provision moving forward, and for all of you in our church family. As we celebrate the start of a new ministry year, we anticipate his continued faithfulness in saving, renewing, and reviving us. 
And we call upon each of you to join us and to be part of what God continues to do right here as one church. And no matter where you are in your discipleship journey, we encourage you to engage in the rhythms of life at Christ Church. We call on you to come seek Jesus with us, seek help among us, seek service, seek discipleship, and join us on the mission of Christ to serve our God and to make disciples who live faithfully united in Christ. As soon as I was saved, I started looking for a church. And when I came here and I was halfway through my first sermon at this church, I knew this was my home. This is what I was looking for. I wanted preaching from the Bible because I didn't have that knowledge base. I had never opened the Bible. I'd never read the Bible. And I also knew I had no knowledge. The first time I went to Christ Church, the first month, really, I would kind of sneak in and, and sneak out. And then um, one day I went in there on Sunday and I kind of felt convicted afterwards to uh, have a couple pray for me. My friend told my husband and I about Christ Church. We were struggling trying to find the right church, and she said they read the, the Bible line by line, verse by verse, and they don't try to practice anything. They just try to share God's Word. Yeah, we're thankful for Christ Church for being the place that we've been fed so much knowledge in the Word and in God, spiritually being able to grow in our lives, you know, that we've never had before. When we went to re-engage, us becoming closer and the other topics and such that we went over and kind of more focusing on how my relationship as well should be with my wife as a husband. I wanted to put God in my life after I repented and asked him to come into my life. I wanted to put God in my life. Small group has, has been a tool that God's used most in my life. I ended up gaining a church family out of that. I love the studies, obviously, being, you know, a science major, I love studies, but serving is really where I'm finding joy. Sometimes I'm ushering, sometimes I'm doing doors, sometimes I'm greeting. You never know where you're going to find me, but it has been a true blessing. The number of people that I get to meet and I see and I say hello to, I learn about God's grace. I learned that no sin is too big for the Lord to forgive and that he walks with you every day. And um, I trust that now. This world is hard enough without walking with the grace of God through it. And this church can help you find the right person to talk to. They did for me. The growth you will get if you reach out and you help others and you grow in your own spirituality, there's no reason not to. There's nothing but positive from it. I always felt welcome from the time I stepped in into the church. I never felt I never felt judged. I, I never felt like people were looking at me funny. I always just felt welcome. And I felt like that's where I belong is at Christ Church. And I felt like because of that, because of the how welcome I felt there, it was easier to, to dive into all those things. We've just been able to have so many more opportunities that have been placed in front of us that God has placed in front of us to move closer to him and you know be less like us and more like him you know that's that's kind of been one of the best parts of us being and being at Christ Church What amazing testimonies, right? How cool it is to see how God is working to transform people's lives. And we believe and are expectant that God is gonna do more of that this year and he wants to do it in your life. But that can't happen unless you're connected. So how do you get connected? What do you need to do to take those next steps? Well, there's two simple ways you can jump on uh, um, our app and all of the opportunity for you to register for a new study, for a soul care group, to get into a community group, all those are there. You can also talk to our team about serving on a team somewhere else. 
uh, throughout the course of the church every single weekend or throughout the different places um, in our ministry throughout the year. So make sure that you look at the app for that. Or today, right after our services, our entire team is going to be waiting in the north side of our lobby to meet you. And they will have all of the answers for you and be able to help you take those next steps into those various rhythms of life here at Christ Church. So don't miss this opportunity to grow together as we are united in a church towards our discipleship this year. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, we have the opportunity to do that through the consecration of our giving. So no matter how you did that this week, maybe that was on the app or through the offering boxes, um, this is an opportunity for us to set our resources before the Lord and to see what God will do in and through those for the glory of his name. The reason that 13 churches have been planted in the last four years, the reason that five more are coming, the reason that we have been able to hear those sorts of testimonies is because of the united, faithful, intentional, and generous giving of our church family. So join with me as we pray over these gifts. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to hear the testimony and to see the activity of your spirit in people's lives. We wanna see more. We wanna see your glory and your name lifted high. So would you take these gifts and in your power and in ways that only you can, would you multiply them for the glory of your kingdom and the glory of your name? And we pray that all in the name of Christ, amen. Let's stand together. Never forget this church family. It's the gospel that unites us, amen. Let's be reminded as we sing this. All sufficient merit shining like the sun. A fortune all in heaven by the work I have done. My righteousness.
God, what a privilege to gather together to rejoice and to celebrate in your complete set-apartness, your otherness from us, your holiness, the perfections of your character, and the limitlessness of your power. 
apart from your grace, we have only cause to dread your holiness, for from it you look upon our unholiness. And your justice must come upon our sin, but you have sent your son while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. You made us sons and daughters. You adopted us fully and freely into your family, and you have made us co-inheritors with your son and our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, you, we are here for you to have the name above every other name. You have entered our humanity. You have been tempted in every way like us, but never sinned. You have died on the cross in substitute payment for our sins. And on the third day, you rose never to die again, resurrected in victory over sin in the grave that we might have eternal life. We cling to you. You are our Lord and our Savior and our King. How thankful we are until we see you that your spirit works in us and among us. So Spirit of God, we're dependent now, as we have been throughout this time together already, that you would work toward us. As we open the Bible, would you help us to see what we would miss, point out what we might somehow be distracted from seeing, illuminate the word. Show us what isn't as it should be. Confront us where we're not right. Guide us in the truth sanctify us with the word, make us more like Christ. I pray for comfort and soothing through the word for those who have come with heavy burdens, serious doubts and difficulties. And then I pray for our friends that are with us that don't know Jesus the way we do, have not yet received that grace that only he can give. I pray spirit that you would draw them to Jesus, show them their own sin, Make it all make sense about who they are by birth and by choice. And then run them to Jesus, the only Savior for their soul. We trust you with all of this now. We're eager for you to work. Enable the gift for the proclamation of the Bible. And we'll turn back praise as you do it. We pray all this together as a church family. We pray it in faith, expectantly waiting to see what you will do. And we pray boldly, believing it's in keeping with your character and your purposes for this time. So we pray it in Jesus' name. If you can agree with that, can you say amen? Amen. amen. You can be seated. Good to see you, church family. We're glad to have a bunch of you back in town and getting back in the rhythms with school getting started and uh, grateful for the opportunity uh, to worship. Thanks for making this a priority in your life this weekend. I know some of you are getting ready to leave to go back to school for college. Some of you are first time doing that. We love you. We're gonna miss you during this school year. And uh, we're praying for God's best in this season of your life. Some of you have grown up here. We've known you since you were little kids. And uh, now you are on your way to college. And uh, that gives us heart ache and excitement for you and all that God will do uh, during that season. God changed my life in so many significant ways. I'm only here today because of what God did in my life during my college years, and I'm very thankful for uh, the opportunity he's gonna put in front of you uh, to grow and change and develop you uh, as you go through this season of your life. Guests, thanks for being with us today too. My name's Adam, I serve as the lead pastor here, and uh, we're always grateful to have guests with us. We have them every weekend. Hope that you have been warmly welcomed and that God will meet you in a big way. It is special to have these guys who are gonna plant churches, Lord willing, with us, and I hope you'll take advantage of that. I do remember my own uh, first service as I was heading into Chicago to do some training before coming here to plant what is now Christ Church, and um, I remember sitting in that service and thinking to myself, like, I'm so excited about what I'm gonna learn. I'm eager to be in the training center. I wanna pick up everything I can. I, I believe that God had set me apart for, for planting another church, and at the same time, I had all of the concerns about what if it doesn't happen, what if nobody comes, what if I can't get anybody to plant with me, um, and all of that comes together in this season of their life. So be an encouragement to them as you see them. Go out of your way to introduce yourself to them. They won't remember all your names, but just tell them that you're praying for them and pray for them. Uh, we were sitting in a service, Renee and I were sitting in a service in Chicago. We were getting ready to come to Phoenix. We already knew that at that point. We met another couple just sitting in the worship service, and they said, where are you all going? And we said, we're going to go plant in Phoenix and they had a house, and they gave us their house down here. So that's the standard we're going for with support, okay? You got a house, you give it up, you got a car, you got piles of cash laying around. 
Church planters are always in for the cash. Help them out, pray for them, do whatever you can. And I know that God is gonna use it in a big way. Man, Vintage Mission is more than just uh, our church planting training. It's actually a partnership of churches. Uh, over 30 churches now are partnered together for church planting. And that means at times that in those partnerships, opportunities are gonna come up for our own team. So today, uh, I don't know how many of you know them, but they're serving in the venue. And I wanted to address, uh, just address this because they're leaving us. Sean and Sarah Gray have been worship leaders here with us for three years now. It's hard to fathom that it's been that long. And um, God has uh, directed their steps and opened an opportunity with one of our Vintage Mission partner churches back in the D.C. area in Virginia. And uh, they have uh, accepted a call to go there and to be uh, involved in the worship and the leadership of that church family. And we could not be more excited. I mean, there's pain in that. Every time uh, our team is sniped and recruited away from us to go somewhere else, that's my words for what's really going on in my heart uh, as the grays leave. Uh, we just open our hands back up, don't we? And we just thank the Lord that he's moving people around for the sake of his kingdom. They have been a tremendous gift to us. They have led us so well. So as you see them in the lobby, and uh, Grace, if you can hear me in the venue, uh, we love you, and we're going to miss you tremendously, and we're full of faith that God is leading you, and that he'll do great things through this next season in your life. All right, let's grab our Bibles. You got Bibles with you this morning? I hope you do. If you don't, and you're a guest with us, there should be one underneath of a seat nearby. You can grab that one and join us together. We're going to kick off our little... A series to kick off the ministry year theme of United. I want to spend a few weekends with you, this one and a few more, uh, just digging into the truth of what unites us as a church family. So I am concerned that we are living in a culture that is incredibly divided and will just keep getting more divided through this ministry year. Can I get an amen on that? At least through the fall, at least through November, and I'm banking on way past November, we are in a divided culture. I mean, just constant division, all kinds of division. So to be a united people will be a bright light in the darkness. It'll be an opportunity for us as a people gathered here under the banner of Christ Church across this city in all of our congregations to be a unique light of a united church. All the diversity in this room, all the different backgrounds and stories, all the different ways that we've arrived here, but united together. Secondly, it's an opportunity for us to be united freshly because every time we start a new ministry year, that means new people are leading, people are transitioning, we have new people coming into our church family, faces just continually, new faces are coming in and coming in and coming in. That means we need to be freshly united together, not assuming our unity, but working on our unity. And thirdly, in a ministry year like this one, just like all the other ones of Christ Church's life, uh, we are going to take... More ground. If God will give us that kindness and favor, we're going to take more ground for the kingdom. We're not here to hunker down. We're not here to hide till Jesus gets back. We're here to steward what he's entrusted to us for the furtherance of his kingdom purposes. And that means we're going to set initiatives before you uh, from our pastoral team for our church family. And anytime we got initiatives, we have an opportunity for a disagreement on the initiative. And if we're not careful, it will fracture and fray our privilege of being united as a people of God. So that's the heart behind this theme, and I want it to be more than just this little startup at the beginning and one video and a couple sermons, but really to be something that carries us together through what no doubt will be a tumultuous and potentially dividing year for us as the people of God. So to start with, I want to encourage you to open up your Bible to Mark chapter number eight. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's the Gospel of Mark, one of the four records of the life and ministry of Jesus. And if you're new to the Bible, don't worry about that. Just open up that little hardback black version of the Bible. And there's a table of contents in the front. It'll give you a page number to mark. And then just go to big number eight, and I'll meet you there. We'll all meet together there in just a few minutes. And we're just going to study what God has to say to us. Fundamental to us being a united people is for us agreeing why we're here. What are we doing? Why are we doing church? Why are we having these services? Why are we all packed into this sardine can that feels like Alabama in the summer? Somebody said last service that they were cold, and I just said, I'm concerned for your health. You need to go get checked out. <laughs> Things aren't good. It's sweaty in here. What kind of monsoon season is this anyway? We got no rain and all the humidity. Why are we doing this? Why are we in here? Why are we singing our hearts out? Why are we praying the way we're, why are we giving our offerings? Why are we meeting up this week? in living rooms all over the valley. 
Why are we gathering around God's word and praying together and carrying each other's burdens? Why are we serving in the City Hope Center and reaching out into our community to the people that are in the most desperate times of need? Why are we devoting ourselves to seeing new churches planted and working not just domestically, but for the nations, for the mission of Jesus Christ to continue forward in our church family? What, why are we doing all this? What is, what is the cause for all of this? And I want to draw you back to church family, something that you know well. Perhaps you're kicking the tires of Christ Church. Let me give this to you. It's our mission statement, and it is not for our legal documents. It is a functional living statement that we connect everything to here at Christ Church. We exist. Christ Church exists on planet Earth to glorify God, for the bigness and awesomeness of God to be known and seen through the fulfillment of the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, identifying them with Christ, and teaching them to observe all that Christ commanded them in the spirit of the great commandment, loving God with all of our being and loving our neighbor just like we love ourselves. That's why we're here. Therefore, at the very center of the opportunity we have as a church family to make God's bigness known is our discipleship. So I want to start with Mark chapter 8 with Jesus helping us to be united or reunited or freshly united or perhaps for the first time united in discipleship. We are not just a Christian club to enjoy being Christians. We are here for the sake of growing as Christians so that we might live on the mission for the Christ, so that new disciples would be made because old disciples are matured and mobilized for the sake of making new ones. Do you know why we're here? We're only here because the kingdom purposes have not yet been fulfilled. People are still going to be saved. Stories are still going to be written like the ones we've seen already this morning and like yours and like mine. Amen? Therefore, in this ministry season, to be united must be that we are united in discipleship, not co-opted for any other third-party agendas, not co-opted for any other thought process for what discipleship is, and we don't get to make it up. We're not making up discipleship. We're not deciding what's involved. We're not deciding what the agendas are. We're gonna go to the Christ. We follow him. He's the Lord. He's the leader. He's the chief shepherd of our church family. So Mark chapter eight gives us a chance to listen to Jesus tell us about discipleship. Good? You ready? Let's read it together. Remember as we read, these are God's words for us. I'll read out loud. You can follow along there in your copy of the Bible. Verse 34 of Mark chapter eight. John Mark, ministry associate of Peter, says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, that's Jesus, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. These are God's words for us this morning. May the Spirit of God help us now to get them to understand them and to be gotten by them, to be moved, to have our lives affected by the word of God. Here's the whole sermon in a sentence. You wanna jot this down, put it in your note app, do whatever you do to try to remember things and come back and be able to look over this again. Christ Church is united in discipleship as defined by Christ. So nobody gets to, we don't just get to sit in the uh, discipleship meeting and decide what discipleship is. We have a savior who defines it for us. We have a leader who we follow. So we're concerned first and foremost with allowing this text to inform the expectations around which we unite in discipleship as a church family. So how does he define it? Well, there are four markers, four markers of the discipleship that Jesus delivers to us through Mark chapter eight. He delivered it to a very real group of people and the spirit of God preserved it the writing of the record, he superintended as John Mark wrote it and gave it to us for our benefit today as well. So if you're jotting them down, I'm just gonna walk right through them. True discipleship is, and it's marked by these four markers. So number one, we're gonna go back to verse 34. True discipleship is obeying 
his call. It's obeying his call. Jesus begins verse 34 by saying, if anyone would come after me. So he's called the crowd. There's a delineation there, isn't there? He's called the crowd. He's called his disciples. And he says, if anyone would come after me, which establishes the conversation, is about discipleship. It's about following Jesus. And the reason for that is pretty profound. I I don't have time to dig all the way through Mark 8 with you, but if you know anything about the New Testament, one of Jesus' disciples' name was Peter, and Peter was known for his mouth. And in Mark chapter 8, Peter has one of the shining moments of his mouth. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And the disciples kind of tell him, people have this opinion about you. This is who they think you are. And then he says to them, who do you say that I am? And he says a plural to all of his disciples, the 12 of them that are there. Who do you say that I am? And just like Peter, Peter thinks that when Jesus asks a question of everybody, he's the one who needs to give the answer. So Peter has his greatest moment. He says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. And you're the son of the living God. The eternal, uncreated son of God who's taken on human flesh to save sinners from their sin. And Jesus says to him, you're right. And you didn't come up with that, Peter. You're not that smart. The father delivered that to you. And there in that shining moment, Peter has answered according to the revelation of the father about the son, the Messiah and savior of our souls. But... The high moment for his mouth lasts about 10 seconds because it's followed up with Jesus making sure they know what his messianic ministry will be. How is he going to be the Messiah? Is he going to come? Is he going to kick butt, take names, and establish his kingdom? Yes, he is, but not until he has died and made a sacrifice for his people. So he tells him he's going to die. He's going to suffer and die, and Peter can't help himself. That's not his idea of messianic ministry. So he says, that is not going to happen. Oh, Peter. Like, I think the disciples were kind of like, at the first moment when he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, they're like, we're with Peter. Yes. And then as Peter says the next thing, Jesus delivers one of the most painful rebukes he ever gives. What does he say to Peter? He says, Peter, get behind me. He calls him Satan. He went from being the highest, I think when he said that, you know, the disciples are kind of like backing up, like, I don't, he, he, that's him. He, he had that perspective. That's what's going on here. There's confusion about discipleship. There's confusion about the Messiah. And Jesus calls everybody in. The crowd that was there observing, he calls them in. The disciples, he calls them in. And he drops on them three commands. Here's what it's gonna be to be a disciple. It's gonna be obeying his call. The three commands are right there in verse 34. The first command is deny, the second command is take up, the third command is follow. The first command is a a point in time. It's the way your life works to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to place your faith in Christ, to have your eyes open that he's the only savior for your soul, to place your confidence in his work for you, his sufficient merit, his good works, his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection, results in a denial of self. Life is not about me and mine anymore. It's denial of self. It's the end of me being the autonomous Lord of my own existence and king of my own kingdom. I'm not in this for me. I'm not in this for my name. I'm no longer living my life as if I'm, I'm on my own category of authority. I submit to Christ. That's the first command. Second command in his call is take up. And he says, deny himself and take up his cross. Now, I know that doesn't hit us the way it hit them. I'm sure of it. Because there were no cross tattoos in the crowd or the disciples that were listening to Jesus. Nobody had a cross hanging around their neck or dangling from their ear. Nobody had a cross in their house. This was the Jewish people under the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire used crucifixion to keep control over the areas that they had occupied. They would establish the beams for crucifixion along major roads. So that as you walk that road 
or rode the animal along that road, you would look up and see or try not to see the crucified bodies that were hanging there. The Roman Empire intended for you to be dissuaded from ever doing anything against the Roman Empire because they can do that to you. No doubt when Jesus said this, listen, there was a gasp in the crowd. You want to follow me? You want to come after me? You want to be a disciple? Discipleship is the end of you. It's the end of your own agenda and your own cause and your own name and your own glory. That's no longer what we live for. And secondly, it's taking up your cross. What did he just say? Because the Romans would require the one who was going to be crucified to carry his own cross beam. He would carry his cross beam to the place where he would be crucified. Then he'd be attached to that cross beam and hoist it up and put onto the center beam. It was the ultimate shame to carry your cross. And yet, that is the very pathway of our Lord Jesus. This is before he died. They, this is before it's, it's, it's really recognized and celebrated what was being accomplished at the cross. And yet, that will be the way of discipleship. We will die to ourselves with Christ. We are with Christ. Suffering to glory. That's our way. We take up our cross. And church family, just so that we're united in discipleship, biblically, let's not cheapen that at all. Let's not cheapen that to some lesser thing. Sometimes you hear somebody who's got food allergies or got some condition they're working through, arthritis is back. They're on some crazy diet. They're a little ashamed of what they're ordering at the restaurant and they look over at you and they say, well, Everybody's got their cross to bear. Don't do that. Not here, not among us. To carry our cross is not some kind of like annoyance or normal human suffering. It's, it's, it's nothing except for the category of discipleship of those who carry that cross because that is the cross upon which we received our salvation. Therefore, we die with Christ and Paul says we are raised with Christ through his resurrection. So when it says take up your cross, it means that I'm dead to me, I'm alive to Christ and I live for Christ. We do have a cross to bear, all of us. It is the glorious good news of the gospel that at that cross, our sins were paid for in full and we received a full and free redemption and salvation for our souls. Amen? Third command in verse 34, if we're gonna obey Jesus, is follow me. And that one is not a point in time. The first two are. They're kind of like the, the whole life changes. I'm denying myself, and my life is no longer about me, and I'm taking up my cross, and that's going to be who I am. I am with Jesus. The third one is an ongoing verb. The way it was written in the original language is following. Follow after and keep following me. This is just our daily life. We just get up again and follow Jesus. I mean, remember those games when we were kids? Simon says, one of the cruelest games, because when you mess up, you just get mocked every time. I mean, your gym teacher would just point it out, call you by name, and be like, well, there's the idiot. Did it again. Patted his head. He's supposed to rub his stomach. Remember Follow the Leader? That's got to be one of the dumbest games ever. I remember in my childhood saying, how do you win this game? Like, what are we doing? Can I, I wanted to combine Follow the Leader with King of the Hill, Okay. I want to become the leader, so I'm going to take out everybody in between me and the leader as we follow. That would have been a game worth playing. Instead, we're like a bunch of fools jumping around, skipping around, following somebody around with no end to it. Listen, we get the concept. We think like him. We love what he loves. We're after what he's after. Our agenda is his agenda. Our great purpose is his great purpose. We're here because his mission is our mission. His focus is our focus. His love is our love, right? That we get it. It's just incredibly difficult, apart from the spirit of God, changing our hearts and leading us in discipleship together. If we are not united in discipleship, it is incredibly difficult to continue to be obeying the call of Christ on our lives. So Christ Church is a discipleship church. That's what we are. And through this ministry year and all the expressions of our life, biggest ones, the smallest ones, most public, the most private, serving on teams, learning in studies, living in groups, doing whatever we are doing together as a church family in the rhythms of our life together, serving in our ministries, may it be that it is provoking and pushing and prodding each other to obey the call of Christ on our lives. May this be the year where we become more obviously 
disciples of Christ through the denial of self, the taking up the cross, and the following after him. Amen? Amen. This is why we cannot be okay with merely attending an event. This is not a cruise ship. This is a battleship. Everybody's got a job. We're here to get a mission accomplished. We're not kicking back at the pool. We're getting to work. And God's grace will sustain us and grow us and teach us and move us forward, becoming more and more obedient to the call of Christ in our life. That's the first mark. Here's the second one. True discipleship is believing his words. Now Jesus drops into four different statements of explanation. They all start with the word for. He's explaining himself. Why would we obey? Why would we obey him? Okay, crowd's in. Disciples are in. Peter had his great moment. Peter had his very much not great moment. Everybody's in. Here's what discipleship's gonna be. Why would we do that? Because we believe what he says in verse 35. It's a declaration. Jesus makes a simple declaration. Look at it in your Bible. For whoever would save his or her life will lose it. But whoever loses his or her life for my sake and the gospels will save it. This is the kingdom economics. This is how it's gonna work. This is the declaration of fact. You can fact check this. Jesus is speaking truth to all who have ears to hear. Hang on to your life. Protect this thing. Serve this thing. Mine and now and here and me and it's all about what I've got and what I want and what I want to get done and my dream and my vision and me and me and me. Listen, you can have it, but you lose the truest life for eternity with all the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. Or all true disciples will relinquish me and now and mine and my and relinquish and put ourselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, the promise for us is that in giving up now and me as the the end for which I exist, I receive the promise of the fullness of his blessing for eternity in heaven as co-inheritors with Christ. That is good news. The gospel is not easy, but it is good All those who have placed their faith in Christ and have been granted new hearts through faith in Jesus will now be responding with a confidence in Jesus that they have never known before. He's not messing around. (laughs) Jesus doesn't say verse 35 and wink at somebody. And it's like, you and I know that I'm messing around, but they all think I'm serious. He's absolutely serious. And what has been revealed and preserved for us is all that he wanted for us to know. If for you to know today, church family, we believe him. We take him at his word. Anybody else, we might be right to say, let's just wait and see if that comes true. Not so with Jesus, not with the one who died and was resurrected and seen by over 500 people who has ascended to the right hand of the Father and will return from generation to generation. Listen to me, not Jesus. Don't wait and see with Jesus. He's telling you the truth. Believe him. Because from generation to generation, he has transformed the lives of countless people from every tribe and tongue and nation, every background and story. My life has been completely altered by Jesus because he is the risen one. He speaks the truth. Whoever saves this life loses that life, and whoever doesn't save this life gains that life. That is the equation of discipleship, and we believe him. Why would we obey him? Because we believe him. Friend, perhaps you've never trusted Jesus. You're in the crowd. I mean, you like Jesus at some level. You're familiar with him. You've got some blessings from being around people who follow him. Let me encourage you that if you just keep living for this life and for you and for now, there is a dire eternal consequence that comes with it. So this week, as we live our lives, not just in this gathering, but in our scattered life together, as we continue to be Christ's church in this community. We are united in our discipleship, pressing one another, helping one another, encouraging one another to believe the words of Christ so that the word of Christ dwells in us richly, so that our minds are renewed by the Bible, so that we are a more and more biblical people, so that we shine more and more brightly out against the darkness of the culture in which we live more and more distinct, with more and more love, more and more hope, more and more peace, more and more manifestations of the Spirit as we endure and continue on in our faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because we believe his words. 
Amen? This is what we need. This is why God has granted us the privilege of being a part of a church family like this one. If you're jotting down notes, maybe get John chapter six down in your notes, little reference that you should have. John six, Jesus is teaching again on this same issue of the distinction of his disciples versus those that are not. John 6, 66 to 69. 6, 66 to 69, and then chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Both of those places, Jesus speaks directly to this same issue. True discipleship is believing him and increasingly believing him. It is not that you have arrived, right? Oldest, most veteran disciple in the room. You got decades and decades. You're a walking Bible trivia. You can handle anything that comes at you with God's word. You have lived through trial after trial after trial, and you have been proven again and again and again. There is a faith and trust in Christ that is matured in you. You live on the mission. You live for the nations. You live for your neighbors to know Christ. There is room for you to believe and for me to believe more and more of God's word to us. Youngest, most immature, come along. And let's grow together in this new ministry year, United in Discipleship. That's the second mark. Here's the third one. True discipleship is trusting his values. If Jesus is the one defining it for us, then church is not just one event we go to occasionally. The church family is for our discipleship. That means that we're increasingly trusting his value system. So Jesus continues, look back at your Bible in verse 36 and 37, and now he gives the logic behind the declaration. Why would we obey? Because we believe him. Why would we believe him? Because his logic is rock solid, air tight. Here's the logic, verse 36, for what can a man give in return for his soul? For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And then verse 37, for what can a man give in return for his soul? Two rhetorical questions to drive home the logic behind the declaration that fuels the obedience to the call. And what is the logic? What is your soul, by the way? Your soul is your immaterial you. It's the immaterial you. It's the part that leaves when you die and your body is still here. It's the part that goes immediately into the presence of Christ or separated from Christ. And it is the part that will receive a resurrected body to receive eternal judgment, or to receive eternal blessing in the presence of Christ. It's the immaterial you. The soul is the invisible you. What would you give for the eternal you? <laughs> what, could you what could you swap out that would make sense for the eternal you? What if you gained the whole world? Have you ever sat, watched a television show, flipped through a magazine or something, and was like, what if, what if I had that? What if I was in that spot? What if that was my job? What if I had that possession? What if I had that kind of power? What if I could get that? Jesus takes all those, those options and lumps them all together and says, if you've got the whole world, just get all of them. You can have all of them. And if you swapped out your eternal soul to get all of those, you made a bad trade. Everything here will burn. Everything here will be left behind. You know about J.D. Rockefeller, right? When he died, one of the richest men in the world at the time. His accountant was asked, how much did Mr. Rockefeller leave behind? Remember this? What was his answer? All of it. All of it. There is no good trade for anything in this world, for this life right now, to live for it, to give our lives away for it, to reject Christ for it, to step out of and push away from any of the offer of the good news of the gospel and say, that'll be for another time. I'm going to live my life for now. I'm going to live my life for here. I'm going to live for this world. Listen, that's a bad trade. These are rhetorical questions. What's the profit? None. It's a net loss if you get everything and lose your soul. Loved ones, our discipleship is just trusting that value system. Again and again and again, helping each other trust it as we, we live our lives, we, we work our jobs, we steward our resources, we care for our families, we enjoy God's good gifts in our life. All of it is, is with the discipleship of trusting his value system so that we might live in a way that would glorify and honor Jesus. The second question is like the first, what could you give in return for your soul? And the answer is nothing. You cannot give anything of this world because nothing of this world is of the eternal value of your eternal soul. 
When I was a kid, for a season, I was really into baseball cards, like really into baseball cards, but I didn't have a lot of baseball cards. But I really knew a lot about baseball cards. I got my Beckett every month. If you know, you know. Beckett Magazine. I studied that thing. I knew about all the rookie cards. I knew about all the errors. I knew everything about which cards were really hot right now. I used to go to the baseball card shop. Those poor guys in that baseball card shop were so tired of opening the last case and letting me see it. They knew I'm never buying any of this. I just want to see it. But I had a neighbor. The neighbor kid lived catty corner to my house, and he had a lot of baseball cards, and he didn't know a lot about baseball cards. That's a winning situation for me. So, I mean, I ripped that kid off. <laughs> I've wiped his name from my memory. I don't remember his name. Somewhere in there, I got really excited about it, and I told my dad that I'd gotten some new baseball cards. And I showed my dad the cards, and my dad knew enough about the cards. As he looked through the cards, he's like, man, these are really, these are really, where did you get these? And I said, I traded for them with that kid across the street. <laughs> and the way he looked at me, I knew this was not going to end well for me. <laughs> And he was like, what did you trade for these? And uh, I was like, mostly like one for one. He's like, what? You did one for one trades? Anyway, the kid got his cards back. And uh, <laughs> all I want you to know is anything, anything that you would say, I set aside Christ and his work for my soul so I can have this is a very, very bad trade. So Mark 8 is in our Bible. Church family, because it will be a battle this ministry year for us to keep living in the values of the kingdom. It's upside down. We don't live for now. We enjoy the good gifts now. We steward the resources now. We have the relationships now. We work these jobs now, but we are not for now. We're living for then. And we have a whole life that has been built on a value system that is completely otherworldly. Understand? So our discipleship, we're going to be united. It's not just that Christians know each other. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is Christians who spur one another on to obey his call, to believe his word, and to trust his values. We give ourselves away. We give our stuff away. We enjoy life as a temporary good gift from the giver of all the good gifts. With gratitude in our hearts, we crush and seek to kill envy and greed and discontentment and covetousness in us. We seek to root out the subtle confidence in ourselves and in our wealth. We fight off entitlement and elitism that people with more are better and favoritism, which seeks to get close to people we perceive to be better because they have more and elevation of any cultural values. Listen, the value system of the burbs out here is not worth living for. We're here. We're a part of this community. We enjoy many of the blessings of the suburbs. And I love the blessings of the suburbs. But they're not worth living for. The American dream is not worth living for. If it is in forfeiture of your soul. That's the value system of Jesus. And discipleship is trusting those values more and more and more through our life in the way we live. Get that? You tracking with me? Thumbs up if you're tracking with me. Okay. Let's go to the fourth one and we'll be done. Last one. True discipleship is defending his cause. One more for statement. This one brings the conclusion of it all and the outcome. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, I think it's metaphorical, the unfaithful generation in which they were existing and we are still existing, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the angels. And listen, that's talking about Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 to 31. We're talking about the end. We're talking about the trumpet sound, the voice of the archangel. Jesus comes back and establishes everything. He judges the living and the dead. And on the day of judgment, those who have been true disciples, who have had their hearts transformed, who have lived their lives progressively obeying the call of Christ, believing his word, trusting his values, and have stood for Christ, have defended his cause, will receive then the eternal reward. He will claim us. 
but he issues this warning. Perhaps you've been around Christ. You've known of Christ. Perhaps you've even identified with Christ, but you are not a disciple of Christ. You have not obeyed his call to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. You do not believe his words, and you live it out, and you do not trust his values because you live on an entirely cultural value system. And therefore, when you are shamed for Christ, you are ashamed of Christ. Jesus promises that the day of judgment will be devastating for those who are ashamed of him. That's the outcome. Loved ones, we will be shamed for Jesus. No doubt about it. Opposition is rising and will continue to rise. Most of our brothers and sisters in the world know more about this than we could ever imagine. Most of our brothers and sisters in the world do not have to be told that we will be shamed for the cause of Christ. Only us in the West are shocked when we're shamed for our walk with Jesus Christ. So remember Mark 8, as we live our life together as a church family, united in discipleship, we are united to help one another, to bolster confidence in one another, to hold one another up, to defend the cause of Jesus Christ and his good news of the gospel, no matter the cost. Shamed, but not ashamed. All of us have some impenetrable loyalties. People can make fun of you all they want. It won't change a thing. And you will smile right back at them and you will tell them, I have them. Some of you have been here long enough to know what mine are. I have athletic teams that you can mock and you can't rattle me. Self-control happening right now, right now. (laughs) Not saying anything. But I'm concerned that when the name of Christ is on the line and I will suffer for it, I'm concerned that without discipleship in my life, without you in my life, without us together united in discipleship, I will be ashamed of my Christ and I will fail the call of my discipleship. And perhaps that's what you're thinking. What if we fail? Perhaps you're thinking I've already failed. I must be on the out. This is it. Perhaps you are if you have in fact rejected Jesus. But let me remind you of who wrote this. Do you know who wrote Mark chapter 8? It's a guy named John Mark. If you're trying to think of the 12 disciples and you're like, which one was John Mark? He's not one of the 12 disciples. He's the personal associate in ministry of the apostle Peter. Peter, who just had his shining moment and then his mouth got him called Satan. Peter, who had heard this teaching in Caesarea Philippi and who not long from this point would say, I don't know who he is. I don't know who he is. I swear to you, I don't know who he is. So if you're still taking notes, jot down John chapter 21. We all need it. John chapter 21, verse 15 through 29, reminds us that God is a gracious, restoring God. The Lord Jesus met Peter along the shore of the lake and he restored Peter. Peter did not persist in his denial of Christ. He did not go on in being ashamed of Christ. Though he had failed, he was restored, and so must we be restored when we fail. John 21, 15 to 29, refresh your memory. The Apostle Paul, Philippians 1 and verse six, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16. I'm not ashamed of the one who started this and will finish it, 2 Timothy 1, 12. May it be that we become a people, because we're united in discipleship here, under the definition of discipleship that Jesus gives, that we become a people who are helping one another obey the call on our life of disciples more and more, believing the word of Christ more and more, and it influencing our lives, trusting his values, and then holding one another up, holding the line, Think back to Red Rover, Red Rover, send whoever over, linking our arms together to defend the cause of Christ and his gospel, even if it costs us our lives. For we have not traded in our souls for this present world. Take our lives and you are threatening us with glory forever. Amen? May this be true in all of our ways of life together. Christ Church is united in discipleship as defined by Christ. We are not in the bleachers watching a few people live life as disciples at Christ Church. Christ Church is the playing field 
and the bleachers are the ones in glory who are observing us on the playing field now. So let's engage in the game. Let's live for our Savior. Let's shine in the darkness, united as his people. All right, we learn in order to live. Three questions. Take them home and we're done. Number one, am I crowd or Christ follower? Fundamental question. Are you in the crowd? You know about Jesus, but you don't follow Jesus. You appreciate Jesus, but you've not denied yourself, taken up a cross, and you do not follow Jesus. You like some of his words, but you don't obey him, nor do you believe his words in any life-changing way. You don't trust his values and live accordingly, and certainly you do not defend his cause if push comes to shove for the name of Jesus. So my call to you would be to humble your heart. There is no other savior coming for you, friend. He's the one. And anyone, anywhere, at any time, who recognizes their sin and the situation between the one true creator God and calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus as the only savior for their soul. Turn away from any other agenda. The Bible calls that repent and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Anyone, including you, right now, if you will believe, you will be saved. That's who you found in this room. Just a bunch of sinful people who have found Christ to be our savior. Come with us, friends. Amen, church? Question number two is for us, church family, how does discipleship unite us? Let's be careful that we're not co-opted for any other agenda and call that unity. We are not here, gathered together under the banner of Christ Church for the mission of Christ for anything except our discipleship to Christ and living on the mission for Christ. So let's be thinking about how we're united in discipleship. Listen, you might be united relationally because of same age group, same stage of life, I don't know, same neighborhood, same part of the world you came from, same Midwestern city that you represent, state, Iowa mostly, Minnesota in there, Chicago, Illinois. I don't know what, I don't know what, I don't know what other things, causes, pursuits, let's just be very careful, let's be attentive as disciples that we are definitively united in discipleship. Let's make that a thing for this ministry year and God will work through that in a big way for us. Number three, last question. Who needs to be made a disciple? We are not merely in discipleship for the benefit of our own discipleship. Disciples who are growing in their discipleship are always then becoming disciple makers. And you have been given a sphere of influence. God has put people all around you. He's put people far away from you that perhaps you will be sent to. We've been praying for some of you to go to the nations, to go to the hardest places where you know no one, but you come for the name of Jesus Christ to be known amongst those peoples. But I want you to consider today and tomorrow that he's already given you a sphere of influence for you to steward for the sake of the mission. You don't write down the world needs to be made a disciple. Write down some names in your notes and ask God to work through your discipleship to lead you then to be the one who presents the gospel to them that they might be made disciples of Christ through faith in his finished work, okay? I think that'll help us to live this because we've learned it from Mark 8. Christ Church is united in discipleship as defined by Christ. Father, thank you for your word. Thanks for this portion. I pray you would use it now, empower in our lives, change the way we think, change the way we live, change the way we love, affect freshly our value systems and our belief structure that generates our worldview and our obedience Give us courage to defend your cause and your name, O Lord Jesus. Spirit of God, help us. We are the followers of Jesus. And we pray for those that are not, that they would become those today through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you paid it all. We want our lives to be for you. So we pray this together in your name. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Let's sing an old hymn and we'll go live on mission for Jesus this week. Savior say, that's 
What a sweet time it's been to be together today, to worship together, to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and to sit under the teaching of God's word. Uh, just such a blessing to be together. Uh, today, if you're carrying a burden, if there's something on your heart that you need prayer for, our prayer team is down front. They would love to meet with you. Come forward. They're going to be here uh, after our service. So make sure that you connect with them. Two things to remind you of as you go today. Uh, the opportunity for you to um, get involved in the rhythms of life here. You can do that on the app or head right out the door and go right to our teams. They're waiting there. And I was over there after the last service and they have like donuts. Not like those little dinky, like round, you know, those donut holdings, like the big fat ready ones for you. So they're there to talk, to hang out, and to make sure that you get connected in the rhythms of life here at Christ Church um, this coming ministry year with us as we are united in discipleship together. So go on mission now with this great truth stamped on your life. You are loved.